Thank you. I'm really very excited to be here, I think, as someone who works with nuclear weapons, nuclear programs, and nuclear disarmament. I think the Korean unification is, an, is a very, very important challenge. And like it was said here, unification is related to denuclearization. I think it, it would be impossible to think that, that uh, the international community would accept a new nuclear country in, in, uh, in the world after unification. So, so we have to try to think of, of models on how to how to exit the nuclear issue. Uh, Ambassador Enkenstein said that uh, the nuclear issue should not hold hostage other things that are important in unification. And I think this, uh, this comment actually uh, leads to the conclusion that uh, denuclearization should take place before unification, or, of course, at least at the time of unification. There are models in the world of how to exit nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon programs, and I think I'm going to be the sunshine actor here trying to provide some of the constructive examples of how has the world before dealt with similar issues. And what are the examples, what are the experiences? In 10 minutes, of course, it's not possible to to go through them very detailed, but I will just, the four models you see here, the Iran model, the South African model, the Kazakhstan-Ukraine model, which actually is a Soviet Union collapse model, and, and then the question of nuclear weapon free zones, particularly in the case of Latin America, where Brazil and Argentine both uh, abolished their nuclear programs. So just a few comments on, on each of these. Ten minutes are not so long, so please, if you want to uh, have some more substance on, on the things, you can look at the paper. I want to conclude on, on what I think this could mean in the um, Korean Peninsula case, so I will use my time on that. But some of the characteristics are important. First of all, the Iran model. It, it is the only example in the world where actually uh, diplomatic negotiations led to an agreement where a country, in this case Iran, denou renounces its nuclear program. They are, there's the Iran deal, the GCPOA as it's called, includes limitations on the Iranian uh, nuclear program so that Iran will not be able to be on the path to have access to nuclear weapons. And after the agreement, there is an agreement Iran is committed to be a non-nuclear member of the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And when you hear these discussions about the sunset clauses of this agreement, uh, it is really, if you criticize the sunset clauses, it's really a criticism of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, because this treaty will be responsible. Iran has to take the most strongest verification uh, regimes. And, and so, in this way, the Iran model actually, with external negotiations, I think this is the only case where a country has given in for external pressure and diplomatic pressure agreed to, to uh, close the path to nuclear weapons. And Europe, the European Union, during the 12 years of negotiation, played a very important role. And I would like to relate this to the Korean question, the, the European Union had sort of a neutral role. It could frame the negotiations in a way that the two hostile parties, Iran and the US, could meet, and during two years of bilateral ne negotiations actually achieve the deal. <coughs> so there is this kind of balance that is needed in the negotiations. The second example is South Africa. South Africa in the 70s had nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union influence in Africa increased, and they thought this was necessary for their deterrence. And actually, in 89, the government decided itself, due to external changes balanced with internal changes, to uh, renounce nuclear weapons and abolish their nuclear programs and dismantle the facilities, and the International Atomic Energy Agency was the actor who, who actually did this. So South African model was actually an 
internal model, there was problems with the apartheid, there were problems, the Cuban uh, forces left Africa, Soviet uh, Union collapsed, and in this new situation, the country decided it did not need nuclear weapons any longer. I will just have to take my glass here. The third model, which led to the third uh, and fourth biggest nuclear weapon countries to abolish their nuclear weapons, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Kazakhstan, 91, already declared itself as, as nuclear weapon free, so uh, nuclear weapon free, and, and has become the sort of front runner in the nuclear weapon free world uh, concept. Ukraine had a more complicated process and, and also has the problem today that when Ukraine uh, renounced its nuclear prep weapons, they were moved to, in both cases, both in Kazakhstan and in, in Ukraine, the nuclear weapons were moved to, the, uh, to Russia. And at that time, there was a Budapest memorandum which actually guaranteed Ukraine that its uh, borders would not be changed because it... it um, transferred its nuclear weapons to another country. And this was, of course, then broken by the Krim occupation. The fourth model, which, which I think uh, we should be really attentive on, is, is the question of nuclear weapon-free zones. These are zones, according to the UN, the UN has uh, criteria for this. These are countries that, in a region, decide not to develop transport and, and have and use nuclear weapons. And it's the initiative of the countries. It's really a civil society initiated process in, in many, many cases. Latin America was the first one. It was already in the 70s that it was agreed that Latin America, including, inclusive the Caribbean, would be a nuclear weapon free zone. And Brazil and Argentine, that, that both had uh, nuclear weapon programs. Actually, in the beginning of the 90s, when the military uh, dictatorships collapsed, actually decided that, it, that they didn't need these parallel programs, they didn't need to threaten each other, and decided to join the nuclear weapon free zone in Latin America. And I think in this case is very important since they are now in many many institutions and I think in the public discussion also the discussion of, of the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Would there be possibility of, of creating a three plus three zone which would include uh, North Korea, Republic of Korea and Japan and they would be non-nuclear nations, not even nuclear umbrella nations and the three others uh, United States, China, and Russia, Russia would actually agree security guarantees so they would not attack or threat, threaten with attack any of the countries involved. So my last question here is then the question of unification. Of course, denuclearization is the goal of the unification process. And the problem is, how do you achieve this goal? I mean, there were already these uh, dark uh, forecasts about what kind of war might, wars might take place. And my question is, what could be the peaceful process where this could be achieved? The first phase would be the freeze. You have to freeze the testing of nuclear weapons. You have to freeze the development of nuclear weapons. And for this freeze to take place, you of course need some incentives from the other side, from this case from the US, but also you need some other things. And this is where the Iran case becomes very interesting because one of the things that was in the Iran case was that for 12 years, the EU provided a table. There was always a table. Even if the negotiations didn't proceed, there was always a place where you could meet, you could discuss the the situation, you could understand each other's arguments. So the existence of a table is, is very, very important. And, and when you talk about North, North Korea coming to the table, I always has, have to ask, where is the table? There is no table. 
The second question is the question of regime change. Already uh, Joe Bosco here indicated that the, that the U.S. is accepting that there will be no regime change. But no, this was the case also in Iran. When there was a threat of regime change from the United States, the negotiation didn't proceed. When the threat was removed by the Obama administration, then negotiations could take place. And the third thing which is important in this discussion of freeze is the question of preconditions. If you have preconditions, like in the Iran case, of suspending all enrichment, even if it's allowed according to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, then, of course, countries cannot show weakness. They cannot go into a negotiation where actually the precondition uh, gives the end result. The same applies to, to the Korean Peninsula. You cannot uh, give up your, your nuclear weapons as a precondition for any negotiations. Why would you do this and show the weakness if, if um, I think politically in any country this would be very, very difficult. But it is important that, that the first step be, be taken. The next step is the question of dismantling of the weapons. And this is only possible in an atmosphere of confidence building. If, if uni unification or the prospect of unification, the civil societies in both countries and also in the surrounding countries could provide an environment where actually the country feels the countries feel that they don't need these nuclear weapons, whether umbrella or weapons, then the environment would be very uh, favorable for, for solving the problem. And in this case, I think the nuclear weapon-free zone in the, in the Northeast Asia could be a solution. I think it, it has some very great advantages. It's not focusing on North Korea alone. It's focusing on the three countries, Japan, uh, Republic of Korea and, and North Korea, it will remove the nuclear threats in the region and it would provide a regional aspect where, where countries could agree regionally and also the f verification of these nuclear weapon-free zones is a regional activity. And then, of course, this would need security guarantees from Russia, China and, and the United States. And I think our Mongolian friend has examples of how difficult it is to get these guarantees, even in, in cases where Mongolia did not have nuclear weapons, wanted to become a nuclear weapon-free zone. But, <clears throat> but uh, this must be the trade-off, this must be the cost-benefit analysis also for these three countries. So my end point here is that it's important to try to create, if you want to solve this peacefully, it's important to try to create a situation where countries don't need uh, nuclear weapons, where the need for nuclear weapons is not there. And I think all the exit models I have tried to indicate to you prove this, that in each case, suddenly, as a result of some social transformation in Iran case, as a result of combination of pressure, and diplomatic solutions, there was the accept that we don't need nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you.